Hello and welcome. It is the preview show and it is an Olympics special. Doesn't come around too often. Uh, couldn't not do a little preview of the Tokyo Road Race. I'm delighted to be joined by James Knox of Team GB. James, how's it going? Yeah, it's going good, thank you. So you are officially a travelling reserve. So I take it that means you get a free tracksuit, you get a free flight, free holiday, all the good bits. Uh, yeah, I'm here on official cycling mold recon uh, preview scouting, you know, uh, undercover mission. In it. No, yeah, that's right. Basically, um, traveling reserve. I was here in case anything happened uh, to any of the lads. Uh, we got four spots, but I'm the fifth man. Um, I'm pretty sure it's already done now. I think it's 72 hours before I won't be riding. But uh, like you said, I've had a, got plenty of freebies, um, had a good time. I actually had some pretty good training, to be honest. So, yeah, I really can't complain. I suppose a lot of people are wondering what can I, what it's like COVID-wise out there. Just now, we're hearing lots of stories of, in the Athletes' Village, people testing positive, but you guys are a wee bit outside that, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, we're doubly um, excluded here in, G in GB because, yeah, um, the cycling is not in, well, actually, the track cyclists, there is a cycling village, which is not in the athlete village. And then on top of that, the all the road race people are out um, basically at the finish of the course, which is in September at Mount Fuji. And um, most of the riders are in one hotel um, down in the town. Um, and, and Great Britain got their own hotel. So we're really excluded. But like you say, uh, there's a lot of talk at the minute about positive cases in the athlete village and, and all this. So, yeah, I really... I have to say, completely isolated from all that. I have no, um, don't really know what's going on over there. And you've been able to train out in the road like normal, yeah? Yeah, we've been told to train on the circuit uh, since Monday, basically, um, like the, the road race circuit. So we've been doing a lot of recon rides, in honesty. And looking at the route, it looks a proper hard one. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, we haven't seen the first... 120 or 100 kilometers um but as soon as you come over to fuji um getting onto those sort of like slightly uh similar roads over here uh we've we've done all of that yeah i've been up this climb that you're picking now um again today but also like three four times in the last 10 days so we're talking 14k six percent not the hardest climb in the world but it seems to go on for a bit yeah exactly um it, it does go on a fair bit, you know, in training. I think it's been taken as a good, uh, I've added like a little Strava segment on my Wahoo from the last, uh, I don't know, seven or 8K and that's been at least 30 minutes and it climbs up a fair bit before that. So I think we're looking, yeah, 50 minutes-ish. So pretty hard climb. Uh, nice, just for the, nice road though. Honest. The road looks quite nice and wide. Yeah, wide roads everywhere. Yeah. Uh, tailwind as well i think on the day so that'll be nice uh, then we've got yeah. the descents look okay is that right the, the descent off it is it uh, they've got these weird little slots in in the in the uh, on the tarmac on corners i don't know if they're like a a grip thing or a icy winter things but it kind of kind of, kind of off putting when you come into a corner the, the very, it's a very fast descent and you'll be picking up a lot of speed on the on the straights and then the, yeah the corner's got these weird little cutouts it's kind of hard to describe but yeah a little bit of an unnerving feeling sort of bouncing over them as you're going around the corners and then but it should be, should be fine we've got is that a couple of laps around the circuit uh yeah the motor racing circuit and then i think everybody will be looking forward to well i think probably only two people will be looking forward to the the main climb of the day the mccuni pass mm. 5.53 kilometers at 11 percent that is just hell yeah it's very very hard i've been trying to find a, a reference point so loads, lots of people have been talking about seviglo and lobandia or mauro de sermano as well and then i had a little thought this morning i remembered the climb in valenciana do you remember that last year that little yeah 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 brute Sierra oh, Altea, Altea or whatever it is, Sierra del Teo. 5k 12%. Yeah, so it's quite a good comparison. Yeah, I'd say that's uh, 
that's about as good as you're going to get, to be honest. Um, it's got these like you forget that the easy parts of the climb are like ten percent. And then, and then when it starts getting up nasty, yeah, it's 18, 20%, but straight line for a few hundred meters, it's really, really difficult. And it's strange to have such a climb so wide as well. You know, the climbs that we just mentioned there, the really steep ones, usually they're so narrow and tight, whereas this is just yeah. a big wide road. It seems, I don't think I've seen anything like it before. Yeah, no, it's got a bit of a feeling like the, the Middle East. When we've been doing like training uh, efforts and stuff, you know, like, some of the lads have been 100 meters ahead of you, but they're actually 20 minutes, sorry, 20 seconds up the road. You know, it's just sort of everyone's, you know, you can see everyone ahead of you, but it's just taken forever. Have they resurfaced that or is it still this sort of? Uh, basically, you see, that's those lines I was talking about. You see those sort of lines on the road? Yeah, I was going to ask you, but they look very, very strange. Yeah, that's that's what I was describing on that uh, other descent. Um, so they're still there? And there is a bit they're still there, yeah, on the on the fast descent, um, and they're also there on this one on their way up. Does it make it harder? It must. It's not smooth, you know. It is. It, yeah, it doesn't really change anything, to be honest. It's just a bit unsettling, you just, especially on a descent when you see them. But it doesn't really change anything. And then, I mean, the, the, we've got a prolonged section. I think I was checking it earlier. There's like seventeen percent, eighteen percent. It's just going to be awful. Yeah, um, I'd say from my experience, yeah, the. And particularly the heat trap as well. Like it's it's really hot. Um, there's bits in the sun. Uh, there's tiny bits of shade. Um, but when you start overheating on the climb and you're going hard, it's it's really really horrible. Like proper grim. Like really like just wanting to climb off. Basically, I've had a couple of like I've gone hard up it and I just wanted to stop and climb off. But you're just forced to keep groveling. Um, and there's no escaping it really. The last K and a half's a bit easier, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a real war. It's death. How how long are we talking minutes wise? Um, for me anyway, um, I wouldn't even say I've been able to go all out the whole way up it. It's just been too hard. Um, it's just been too hot and too hard to even do a max effort. But I've been climbing it um about as fast as I could in training, about 28, 29 minutes. And I know like the the Strava records down at like 24. Um but to be honest, in the race, I don't think that anyone's gonna go that fast. You know, people are going to be hot. People are going to be tired. Um, I don't think it's going to be very different to rocking around in training and just doing one max effort up it. And does it have this these sort of weird circles on it as well still? Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's the worst part as well. That's the worst part of the whole climb when you've got these weird little concrete oh, circles. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's for grip, isn't it? Just like making uneven tarmac so uh, it doesn't get too icy. I don't know. But that bit, that bit there, this is horrible, this bit. This bit's so hard. 17%. Yeah, just goes on and on and on. 19.6%. Jesus. Yeah, and then you get to 10% and you're like, oh, it's flat again. It's, it's only 10%. It's easy, this. Oh, it just looks, yeah. But then the decision to make it crest with, I mean, what is it? 33 kilometers to go. I mean, it gives some people hope that they might get back on. What's the yeah. descent? Or the descent is relatively short, isn't it? And you've got another small climb and then a longer descent. Yeah. So you, you descend down to the lake, um, pretty straightforward, only a few corners to worry about. Left on the lake, um, basically flat, rolling over towards this next left turn. Well, I mean, I'm miles, I'm getting miles ahead of you now, but um, by the time, yeah, um, by the time you're in that finale, you've got to turn left and do another climb to get back over the sort of same. The same range of hills to then drop down towards the the Fuji Speedway. Yeah, that's the little bit I'm talking about now. You see, come down the descent, left onto the lake, basically flat around the lake, and then yeah, a little climb. But that little that little climb's not easy, especially when it's going to be 215k into the race. Um, you know, two like k think... something. There's a two k five percent something like that. Thanks. That sounds that sounds bang on. Yeah. But yeah, as you say, fatigue in the legs. Yeah. Could blow somebody. What what about the, the weather? I mean, everybody ugh, it's one of the big things people are talking about. You know, you've been out there for what is it like a week, 10 days? I've been out 10 days, yeah. So has uh, Adam and Simon Yates. Uh if you look at social media, you'll see that Remco's been over relatively Similar. early. Shackman. Yeah. yeah. So you guys go over, you acclimatize to not only the heat, but I think. People seem to say the humidity is the worst of it. So you get that acclimatization, you do your training, 
and then you do the race. Then you've got the guys coming for the tour who flew mm. on Sunday night, arriving yep. Monday, late Monday, if you include the time difference. You know, I suppose we'll find out after the race, but what's your gut about the best preparation coming into the race? <laughs> it's really hard, isn't it? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think obviously what you've got to bear in mind, what is the best preparation is also individual to some extent. Um, so there is no right formula, is there? Because um, everyone has different things that work for them. I know if it was me, um, because of the conditions, you know, I, I do uh, need, like to be adapted, if it's, especially if it's humid. I remember on Team Wiggins, we flew over and did like a, basically a mess in Hong Kong and we arrived like a day or two before it was like kind of like the worst of what people are expecting here it was like 36 degrees and 60 percent humidity and I lasted about 10 minutes of this commess and I just blew my doors my heart rate was just through the roof and I was just gonna have a heart attack I was really gonna have a heart attack so taking that into account I think um there is one thing that a lot of people coming from the tour it's not it's not cold in France is it they're gonna be fairly adapted to the heat they're gonna be very fit um they shouldn't be, unless they're absolutely exhausted from the tour, they shouldn't be in a bad situation, but you just never know. Um, I think the guys have made the effort to come out here early, um, should be used to it, especially when you consider, I think the last, like, particular like, last five days we've had here appear to be worse than the race itself. So maybe that makes it easy for the guys coming from the tour, but also I guess it means that the guys who've been training in the real humid, real hot stuff now um, are going to find it relatively a little bit easier than what they've been out training in so yeah there's a lot there's a lot of things to take into account and yeah i mean everyone's gonna everyone's gonna tell you what's the right idea just on who wins the race but i don't think it's you know it's it's a really tricky one because people look at san sebastian as a a kind of reference point because it's a week after the tour normally but i don't yeah it's, it's really hard to compare it because normally after the tour the winner will go and have a big piss up somewhere They'll ride the yeah. criteriums, then they'll come to San yeah. Sebastian, and like, let's be honest, it's not, it's not the Olympics. So, the, you yeah. know, the, the motivation is not the same. So, Pogachar, he's won yellow, he's walked, he's walked it by minutes. He's not had all the celebrations. He's so for people to turn around and say, "Oh, he's not going to win. He's going to be tired." That's a big bold statement, I would say. Yeah, oh, yeah, and when you start looking at the shape he was in. Um... He still has to be, he still has to be the favorite, you know, and then it's really, yeah, I mean, just think, I, mean, I don't even know what to say, to be honest, it's, it is really tricky. Um, and you got a lot of guys coming from the tour, you know, when, when you start thinking who's come from the tour, um, there are a lot of the big names, aren't they? Uh, I guess like Shackman, the Yates's uh, came over early and stuff, but, and Remco also, I don't know if there's going to be, so I don't know if there's going to be an obvious difference. I think if you're going to correlate a graph of preparation and results, you wouldn't be able to find much of a difference. I think everyone's tried to be 100% whoever have been at the tour or when they've come here from elsewhere. So um, who's go best, who goes best on the day is, could be just down to them, to be honest. Because you've got the guys who they've raced the Giro and then the Italian team did the, the small race in Italy as preparation. You've got the guys who did, like Nibali did two weeks of the tour, Simon Yates as well, to be fair, he crashed out. You've got the guys who did three weeks of the tour riding GC. You've got the guys who did three weeks of the tour not riding GC. You've yeah. got Remco who did Giro and then Belgium tour. And then you've got Adam Yates who hasn't raced since Liège in April. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm glad you're struggling to work it out because I, I can't work yeah. it out either. Uh, no, I don't think... Talking to GB, what's the, what's the mood in the camp like? Yeah, it's been really good. Uh, I mean, it's been great to be a part of GB, and I've got to say, everyone's in seems to be in good spirits. Everyone's pretty up for it. Um, there's not really been any team tactics or anything, so I won't. I can't really comment on what the plan is. But from what I've seen, training with everyone, everyone looks to be in good shape. Uh, Simon Adam have been kicking my head in, so that's always a good sign. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping the lads get up there. It'd be yeah, I've got three Grand Tour winners and, and Adam Yates. That's not a bad situation to be in, is it? <laughs> and as hard as it is to work out the best route into the race, working out the tactics for the race is just about as, as difficult. So we've got teams of five. We've got the Dutch, the Belgians, the French, the Italians and the Spanish. We've then got teams of four, Colombia, Denmark, Germany, GB, Norway, Slovenia, Switzerland, Australia 
and then the normal threes, twos, and ones. We've got a field of, I think it's now down to only 128 riders, 40 of whom will be out the back door as soon as the pace goes up. Yeah. Nobody wants to take Pogacar to the final climb. Yeah. Like, it's just going to be chaos. Yeah. I mean, I agree. How, how do you tactically, there's no race radios. I mean, I'm thinking there'll be a breakaway, normal kind of breakaway. But then once we hit that, that middle climb, uh, the long one, I think lots of riders will want to try and get up the road at that point. And that could be the winning move. Yeah, um, I agree. I completely agree. Um, and when I first saw it, I thought it'd be really decisive. But um, it's going to take a really, really big effort for like guys who are still big names, guys who are capable of winning the race to get away on that second climb without the likes of... Uh, you just look at the Slovenians, for example. If, if Roglic and Pogicar go right, we just want to be there um, to race for the win on that final climb. To really make a difference and get away on that second climb. I don't know, just taking someone, for example, like a Wout Van Aert, it's going to be very hard to actually drop Roglic and Podjikar, even if they make a really big selection on the second climb, um, to have much of a, a gap coming into the third climb. I think, I think the race could just potentially start a lot, lot earlier, because like you say, there's going to be less teams, less organisation, um, and that's also going to be in all the riders' minds, isn't it? So you like sort of, you, your big hitters, if you take Rog and Podj, um, depending on who's going well in, in Team GB, um, can't think else who's going to be the Remco also these guys they're not also going to watch going to let 10 guys just slide up the road on the second climb and then stop stop uh, stop riding behind are they they're going to be thinking need to stay in front can't let 10 strong guys go because it's going to be everyone knows there's going to be less cooperation everyone is going to be concerned I need to stay in front need to stay in front so my only feeling is that everyone's going to be so nervous about that second climb um, that it could already be a pretty big selection just because yeah people start attacking going hard and then it's just already 30 guys left instead but that's just another possibility isn't it it's just <laughs> I, I can't work it out i mean people are saying it's like liege and it's, it's nothing like liege in my opinion it looks like a grand tour stage uh yeah it's got, that, yeah. it's got that feel about it but obviously without the control and even some of these big teams that have got five riders they aren't that strong uh, like the French, I've got five riders, but you know, yeah. they're, they're not going to be up there in contention. I don't think. Like Spain, Spain look quite strong to me. They've got Valverde. I mean, it's almost ridiculous to be considering a forty-one-year-old who might go and win gold, but yeah, he, he can handle the heat. He can handle the humidity. Having that, I think, having the tactical nous is going to be so important without race radios, like experience. Reading the situation, I was thinking this morning, somebody like G, somebody like Garrett Thomas, who's been there time and time again, just to read the tactical situation in the race, I think that's going to be vital. Yep, I'd agree. And I've got absolutely no idea how it's going to be won. <laughs> no, but um, it is a long way. If you go in, anyone who's going solo over that, uh, the last steep climb, it's going to be such a big effort to get a gap um, and be in the red then to then take it all the way to the line. That's going to be... Yeah, it's a difficult one to really hit out. So either a small group work together or it comes back to a different group, a bigger group, sorry. And it's a different dynamic. I remember the last Olympics, the Rio road race, and we've seen in the Tour de France recently, if you get one guy who goes away, the second group don't cooperate. It doesn't matter how many riders are in there. The, the new thing is that they just don't get the solo rider. But last time round in Rio, it was totally different because the medals were on the line. So I think Micah was away and you saw Fuglesang work with Van Avermaet to bring him back. Now, normally he wouldn't do that, but there's a gold medal on the line. So it kind of changes how people are going to ride it, I think, as well. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it does. I think it makes a big difference. It's sort of one-off. It's Olympic Games. Everyone, I think everyone knows coming away with a medal is a massive achievement, isn't it? So uh, riding to be in contention with a medal is a bit different to riding for like you say, staging the Tour de France that's sort of slipping out your fingers and maybe to help people, you're sprinting for fifth. So basically, we've got a route where we've got no idea how it's going to work out. We know it's just really difficult. The climbs, particularly the last one, is awful. We've got lots of humidity. 
hopefully it's not actually I just say that the actual race day temperature just now doesn't look too bad we've got a uh, route into the race again which nobody knows which one is going to be the best and we've got a small field it's just going to be anarchy and chaos from the, the start to the finish where, where are you watching it are you going to go out onto the road or um I won't really be watching it mate I'm, I'm traveling back to Europe on Saturday because I'm not racing um uh, that was sort of the agreement with uh my team so I didn't really impact on my like racing schedule with them so uh yeah I will be getting updates on my phone or I'll be up in the air so I won't be I won't be seeing anything to be honest <laughs> all that way you don't even get to see the race yeah yeah so what's next then what, what's what's next on the schedule for you um I'm doing San Sebastian next Saturday and then for the weather nice yeah so that's the plan for the moment. Hopefully, all goes to, yeah, stick to that, see what happens. Go on then, put your money where your mouth is. Who wins on Saturday? Um, <coughs> in, uh, I'm under pressure now. I've got, I'm getting spectated. I'm going to say Podjakar just because he's been, uh, seems to be a bit untouchable, even in a sort of Liege scenario. He's strong enough that if he cut a few guys go with him, he'll be happy to take them to line, happy to hit him a few K from the line, whatever. Yeah, I think any scenario is going to be very, very difficult to beat. So that's my pick for the win. So you've gone with a favourite. Nice and nice and brave you there. Uh, and yeah, who's, your, yeah. who's, your, who's your outsider? Come on. Um, outsider. Pressure. There's a lot of pressure getting stared down here. Um, yeah, but I'm, out, Adam's not an outsider, is he? Proper outsider. Adam, um, well, Adam's, you know, he's quite far down the list of the bookies. He's about 25 to 1. Is he 25 to 1? Yeah. I, he's my outsider then, if that's how far down the, the bookies he is. Bold picks. I'm not going to pick. It's, uh, it's too hard. Oh, well, that was also very brave. <laughs> right, James, thank you very much. Uh, been a pleasure as usual talking to you i hope you enjoy your flight home yeah thank you very much <laughs>